Well, I'm not playing cards, but I have got all the flow charts of this series that we've gone through beyond doubt. We've thought about the existence of God, and we've gone through the logic of that. We've thought about resurrection, the biggest miracle of all, and worked out that, well, miracles can happen. If that's true, then Jesus healing a blind man or a leper is relatively simple for him to do. We've thought about the Bible, and we've checked up on some of the accuracy of that wonderful book, the world's bestseller. There's a whole lifetime you can spend checking up on the Bible and learning from history, geography, archaeology, all sorts of other sources how accurate the Bible is. We've discussed how narrow Christianity is, but we've learned that also other religions are narrow. And when Jesus said he is the way to God, then he really means it. All religions can be wrong, you remember, or one of them can be right. That's just plain logic. Some people say that Christianity is an emotional crutch. Well, it can be, but it isn't only a crutch for people that are a bit weak in the head. It's something that really meets the deepest needs of human beings. Hypocrites in the church, we've admitted. There may well be hypocrites in the church, but just because you find a fake fiver or a dud 10p pence or something, you don't throw all your money away, do you? At least not if you've got any sense. Find a few counterfeits in the church, tough, you know, reject them. Look for the reality. The enormous one on the suffering question. Why do the innocent suffer? Comes up regularly. We were down in Bridgewater today and people were coming up with that sort of question many, many times when we were talking to them about the Christian faith. What about those who have never heard Jesus and his great love? We've discovered that is all in God's plan and those who seek will find. We also thought about good works. Will good works get you to heaven? How good do you have to be? And we've worked out you have to be perfect. And we also worked out the logic that that's impossible. Not to worry. God has overcome that by the cross of Jesus Christ. He's made it possible by the gift of God, which is eternal life, for us to be with God forevermore. Because Christ has dealt with the penalty of our wrongdoing. He's rubbed it all out. He's erased it. He's cast it from his mind never to remember it if we receive that gift. And we thought about the question of belief. What does the Bible mean when it says belief? And we've worked out that it means actually receiving him, relying on him, totally trusting our life to Jesus Christ. Not having all our questions answered, because when you're talking about God and origins and things like that, you can't have all your questions answered. You'd have to be God to know everything like that, and none of us can say that. So we've discussed many things. What belief is, and the fact that it seems a bit simple, doesn't it? Just to say, I've received Christ by praying to him and asking him to save. It does sound lame. It does sound easy, and relatively it is easy to become a Christian, but of course it's not easy to be the Christian that you've become because you have to carry on the thinking process and get there in the end to eternal life. This is the flowchart of t tonight's program. How can a person actually know that they are going to heaven and they're absolutely certain that's going to happen? Assurance. In the Bible there's many verses that give us assurance of salvation. Our faith is based upon this book, the Bible. That's why one of our questions was how accurate is the Bible? If the Bible is accurate, then the promises in the Bible are something that we can build our life on. We've discussed very, very briefly the prophecies in the Bible and how accurate the Bible is. In the little books that John wrote towards the end of the Bible, not John's Gospel, but the little letters that John wrote, there's one, two, and three, right towards the end of the Bible, in 1 John, I've counted all the way through the five chapters of 1 John, and I found out that this word, this verb, to know, to know, appears once in every 2.8 verses. So almost once in every three verses comes this word know, or the verb used in some other form that we might know. These things are written, says this book, that you might know. 
So Christian assurance is not being arrogant. It's not being proud or boastful. It's exactly what God wants for us. He wants us to know in the middle of all our doubts, in the middle of all our feelings, in the middle of all our sin and inadequacy, in the fact that none of us can be perfect, we can know because God has promised to give me eternal life, to give you eternal life, that based on God's word, I know it to be true. All the way through this little book, you get these wonderful passages. And John says, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's pretty easy, isn't it? You're either in or out. You either have Christ or you don't have Christ. You're either saying yes to him or no to him. If you're saying maybe or I'll think about it, you're still saying no. Those that say yes to Jesus Christ immediately have within them, by God's Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, and feelings too, which come and go and are not to be relied on totally, but they can help, that we know that we're going to heaven. Not because we're good, but because God is good. And because the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is enough. So we know that what the Bible tells us about assurance is true. When it talks about eternal life given to those who trust Christ, it's true because we've proved already that the Bible is true. So all these facts about us personally are true as well. Remember we thought about those people who profess to be Christians and aren't. They're very often the ones we call hypocrites. But they can't be hypocrites because, well, they're not real Christians. It's not a, a question for us to think about because they're not real Christians. There are a lot of fake Christians around, people who profess that they're Christians and haven't really found out what it means to be a Christian. You ask a few people around what they think a Christian is and you'll get 101 different answers. It's amazing. So to be a Christian, you are a one who is possessing eternal life. It has been given to you by the grace of God and you've received it. Therefore, you are a possessor of the word of God, the promises of God and the eternal life that comes from it. The Holy Spirit has come to live in you and perhaps you do feel something at the time. Perhaps you don't. I'm not a great one for feelings. But there are times when I feel married and there are times when I don't feel married and I can assure you I'm married. There are times when my wife knows she's married uh, but wishes she wasn't <laughs> when I'm being a pain, but she's married. And feelings come and go. Feelings aren't the be-all and end-all. What is the case for us to consider is God's grace has been shown to those who trust him. God's riches at Christ's expense. If you've come to the cross and found out what it means and given your life to Jesus Christ, then you have eternal life. It's something that God gives to his children. It's a gift. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. It's the gift of God. We do good works after that because we love Christ and he's done so much for us. But it's a gift for which I did nothing. It's a gracious gift that I do not deserve. But I've got it because I've received it. I've believed in Christ rather than just believe about Christ. So can I lose this salvation? Well, what sort of salvation is it? The Bible says it's eternal. How long is eternal? It goes on forever and ever. So am I going to ever lose it? No, I'm not. You say, well, you might sin badly. You might, I don't know, embezzle a lot of money or you might commit adultery or you might even murder someone. I hope not, sincerely, but I stand before you and say it is a possibility because sin and the Holy Spirit live in my life. Until I'm in the presence of God, I'm going to have sin hanging around me. That's why Christians aren't perfect. We make mistakes. We try to get better and God wants us to get better. But it's not depending upon my good works before I was saved and after I'm saved. It's the fact that God has given me eternal life. It's the fact that God has placed me in his family. I can't get out of my home family. My mother and father were responsible for the fact that I'm here. And even if I didn't like my parents, even if I wanted to change my name, even my nationality, and, and go and live in another part of the world and say I am not a member of that family, it wouldn't be true, because I am. I was born into that family. And when you're born into the kingdom of God, you can never be unborn. You are born and you will live a life. 
very long or short, whatever, but you're in that family, part of that family, and God says to us, you're part of my family. To as many as received Christ, to those he gave the right to become, not be thought of as, but actually become children of God. So the moment I came to Christ at the cross and said that I wanted to give my life to him, I was given the right to come into his family. He brought me into his family. So, as we've thought all the way through this series, it's a matter of the head. Yes, you've got to think. God has given you a brain and reason to use. But it's also a matter of the heart. There must be a response from me. Right in the very centre of me, I must come to terms with this wonderful God who died my death on the cross. The one who now wants to make me free the one who wants to be my eternal lover, the one who wants to be closer to me than even my wife is or my family or anyone else can be. He wants to be first in my life. He's my creator. He's the one that gives me the breath to breathe. He's the one that has promised to give me eternal life, and I believe that. And you too can know that. If you think it through in your head and then with your heart say, yes, I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to totally rely on it. It's not a leap into the dark. It's rather a leap into the light. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the one that can make us make sense of our life. So at the end of this series, we're left with a choice. Do I want to be in the family of God or not? Do I want to have eternal life? Do I believe the Bible is true? Or am I just one of these people that say I want but I don't actually possess Christ. Think it through and do something about it and you'll find that God will meet you. You come close to God and he'll come close to you. That's a promise from God's word and it's true.